Hello, and welcome to episode 43 of the Peter Podcast. I'm your host, reporter Taylor Clydesdale, and with me this week is Dean Pappas. Dean is running for re-election in Town Ward in the October 22nd municipal election, and today we're going to be talking about transportation in and out of the downtown. Well, I don't think it's just people who don't own cars who, who transit. I don't think, I think that's a misconception that if I don't have a car, people who have cars still, still use the buses. I'm one of them, actually. I have a car and I still use the bus, because mm-hmm. there's sometimes I just don't want to drive. Right, I just hop on the bus. I come downtown. <laughs> right, you know, you know, I only live. I live. I'm fortunate. I can walk. Right, 20 minutes from here. Mm-hmm. So, but you know, in the winter, you hop on the bus. I don't want to drive. It's winter. I'm gonna get a bus downtown. And we're also going to be talking a bit about public engagement and his reasoning for why he voted the way he did on the PDI sale. So, hope you enjoy the show. I'm Dean Pappas. Uh, I am. We are in Pappas Billiards. Uh, I am the city councilor for Town Ward and. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to, uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to to be able to say that for the last 12 years. I mean, it is, a, you know, when you go through an election and you knock on doors and it really is humbling when people are like, yes, Dean, I'm going to support you. Yes, Dean, I'm going to support you. And it, it, it really is a, it really is a humbling experience. And it's been, I've been very fortunate that I've had broad base of public support over the years. So. And you're aiming to turn that 12 years into 16 years. Yeah, hope, hopefully, uh, <laughs> as, as hopefully, I've done a good job for the good people of Town Ward and the city of Peterborough at large. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I'm and I am re-elected on the on, on, on the 22nd. And, and uh, I feel that I've done a good job for the for, 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 for my constituents. I've always been there. I'm a very accessible person. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm easy to talk to. You come in here and we'll have a coffee and work out the problem. <laughs> figure it out right so that's always been kind of our strength and maybe it's who I, I am too and my family obviously has been a part of the, of the community for for years right you know I went to Queen Mary and PCBS and Trent University and you know I basically grew up right here where we're sitting right now right you know, <laughs> hey, so, and we're both PCBS grads we're both so. PCBS yeah exactly <laughs> well you're very fortunate to be a Raider oh it's yeah. just like a cult buddy. <laughs> <laughs> like a Raiders for life <laughs> Raiders for life mm-hmm. yeah so uh, I get that at the door too. Yeah, people are like, "You're a raider." I was like, "Yep, <laughs> you know it." <laughs> you have all those little kind of, you know, big and small local connections. Sure, it's that. It, you know, the other big one I get is Champlain College. Yeah, at Trent because I was a Trent mm. grad, but I went to Champlain College. It was the college I attended mm. in Trent, and uh, people are like, "You're Champlain College guy, aren't you?" I was like, <laughs> "How'd you know?" And they're, you wouldn't be anything else. <laughs> so, what are some of the things you know that, so, that you've done over the course of your uh, of your your tenure as a counselor that you would say are kind of major accomplishments of yours? Well, some of the things that you're proud of. We've done. Uh, you know, it's been. You know, one thing I like about being in politics is every issue is different. You're always coming up to a new to a new uh, a new problem or a new issue, and I love the constituency oh. work. And I think. If you want to say the one thing I'm most proud of, it's working with my constituents and working with the good people of Town Ward and, uh, and helping them through issues, helping them navigate the halls of City Hall, you know, get through all the red tape. So if you're asking me for accomplishments, I really think the groundwork is the best. And you can't overlook that. You know, as, as a politician, I think you lose touch mm-hmm. when you lose touch with the people. But if you're asking about kind of bigger issues, too, I think, you know, uh, we did the bottled water uh, in, the, in the first term of council, and we got the central area master plan. When I ran in 2006, one of the issues was that there hadn't been a concerted central area master plan for the whole central area in in a, almost a generation, right? And for people who aren't aware, what's the central area? Central area is uh, it's not Schedule J, which is kind of a salamander commercial core. Central area is more of a broader circle around the downtown and okay. around Little Lake, so. Basically, Town Ward's a little bit of Ashburnham, sort of the central core of the city. Okay. So uh, the Central Area Master Plan came forward with a number of, of, of recommendations and, and a vision for how downtown would grow, right? So early on, that was one. That was those two, the, between the bottled water and Central Area Master Plan, I feel were very important to kind of happen back then too. So, you know, and then every you know, in every term of council, there's another project comes up, right? So I've you know, I've been fortunate enough that communities have, have, have decided to work with me and get their projects through the basketball courts, as simple as the basketball courts and the, and the new uh, 
and the new uh, playground over here at the uh, Simcoe in Bethune Park, mm -hmm. which I think should be called Stomp and Tom Park, but that's a whole different, that's a whole, a whole different discovery. So, you know, those projects, you know, the, the ball field at Trent, mm -hmm. you know, uh, working with uh, Stephen Franklin and uh, the PBA and the Blue Jays and, and the good people in, 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 out in our community to kind of pull that project together. It just shows when people pull together in the same way, you know, that's a, it's a beautiful facility. Right, we we've had interest from semi-pro teams hmm. who want to move to Peterborough because we're doing these this facility, right? So, I mean, over and over again, there, there are projects that spring to mind that I've been happy to be a part of and, and help lead. So, and what's it like to have been a counselor for Town Ward in specific? Because I feel like Town Ward um, has a lot of pressure on it put on by the by by people in the rest of the city. People look to Town Ward for for projects that are happening that aren't happening and kind of point to it as, as kind of well it's the, it's the center of people sure sure it, it's i always i've always said it's the most important uh ward okay. in the whole city even at some points even though we had a smaller of the population now we have pretty well the, the biggest mm -hmm. of populations in, in in the city for Since all for they all the did wards. that uh, change they, over with yeah, the wards last year yeah so people of town ward uh, over the years and i've known this from even before i was on council because of where we are and the business that we run and they are the most engaged I shouldn't I'm not dishing any other <laughs> words so don't please don't hate me <laughs> but uh, uh, town wards is pretty engaged in a lot of issues a, lo a broad spectrum of issues so being a counselor for town ward is really rewarding in that way because uh, I love engaging with my constituents and they and uh, some of our constituents are very much engaged and what and, are some of the ways you do engage with your constituents well, you know, like I said, I'm very accessible off the top, right? You know, I'm, I'm here. Uh, I, I love to sit down with people and have a coffee and discuss their issue or go to their house. I'm more personable one-on-one. -on -one. Still not that techie with my phone, but <laughs> I like the I like the one-on-one -on -one times. And uh, we've always held these town ward town hall meetings uh, since 2006. I was elected 2006, so it would have been 2007 and on that we've held them, and we've held very many different formats. From you know the tr the traditional council meeting type to round tables to barbecues to any form of public engagement, right? so we always searching for what fits. I've done Twitter town hall meetings, mm -hmm. right? So I mean, there's always a form of, of of engagement there, and I think that's important. I've always valued that engagement. And engagement Apologies. is very important when it comes to yeah. to any level of politics, yeah. but municipal politics especially. And one of the complaints that uh, I've heard uh, many times from people about this council is that uh, it doesn't seem to engage with the public. Yeah. Do you think that you're a part of that? Or do you think that that's outside of, of, of what you've been doing for your ward? Or what, and what do you think can be done to rectify those concerns? Well, I, th I, think, I think people, there are different, there's different ways of calling engagement, right? Mm -hmm. Because when I engage people, it's on this kind of level. Right, it's like, what are your concerns, and you know, how can I help that out? And even during big debates, like probably for the the most glaring one is the PDI debate, where those surveys were out, ninety percent were against the sale, and I voted against the sale, and I and I had engaged the public. We had those public engagement meetings through throughout the, the summer, but there's a real difference between public engagement and and listening to the public, right? So you can you can engage them, and then I've always tried to engage them and understand both sides and make an informed decision and sometimes you're splitting the baby, but on the PDI it was a pretty clear, you know, it was, it was a no, there was no splitting the baby, right? So, uh, so I feel on that issue in particular, people felt not listened to or not engaged. So what are they, the question then begs, what are you talking about? Are you talking about doing what I want you to do or are you talking about engagement? Because you know, on that issue, the engagement was there, but people didn't listen. Right? The mm -hmm. majority council went the other way. And that so, does so I mean, that's a different argument. I don't know what yeah. you. I don't know how you. You know, I think you solve that by maybe. You know, it's it's an election, right? But I think you have your election, and then you talk to your councillors. If it's if that was the issue, you bring it up. Mm -hmm. You know, why did you? Why didn't you listen to me on that issue? And, and do you have people who you've talked to at the door who, you know, you've, you've had to explain why you voted on certain issues I'm, the way you did? I'm pretty easy, though. I voted against PDI, so <laughs> I usually get the pat on the back on that one. <laughs> I usually get the pat on the back on that one. I guess you have a little bit less to explain uh, on yeah. that. Yeah. You know, and I'll be, here, I'll give, you a, I'll give you a classic example. I, I was knocking on the door, and I won't identify areas or people, but 
I was knocking on the door, and I walked up, and the guy was like, you put the sign up. I was like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I literally had said earlier, it's knocked on the door, right? And, and uh, he said, you want to know why? I said, because well, I'm devastatingly handsome. <laughs> and, you know, he was just, you know, it's, it's, it, was a, it was a funny thing. And then he says, you know, and then we, you know we, of course, we introduce ourselves and talk. And then he's just like, you voted, I, I emailed you because I didn't like how you voted on an issue. You emailed me back, and then you called me, and you explained why and what the public was thinking and what the reasons were and you were you were honest with me hmm. and i and he said that's all i can ask of you right you're open and honest and you're not ducking and dodging any questions and you and you and, and you're and you're and you're accessible you're here at my door you're i can always come down for a coffee and meet you and, and hang out so even though i didn't agree with them on the issue they still voted for me because hmm. they liked my open and honestness so right. what kind of issues are you uh, talking with people about at the door? What are, what are some of the more well, common things to pop up? Well, I think a lot of it comes back to the official plan review. And that's one thing I have been talking quite a, a lot about, is people, people see, do see all these plans, like it's the Central Area Master Plan, the Little Lake Master Plan, the, you know, even, our, even our Transportation Master Plan, which needs an update. I've been talking about that. That's been getting a bit of, of traction to housing. But a lot of that we need direction from the official plan. We need the intensification targets mm -hmm. in the central area, especially in town ward, especially in the central area, our, our intensification needs to happen. You know, when you look at that, uh, that map, I don't have it on me. I got it on my phone if you want to see it, <laughs> but it, it shows that we have 12,000 lots, right? But there's no, that's, that's the uh, Hempstead report for our, de our development charges. And they went around and they, they, they measured out the areas and there's room for 12,000 lots. And but there's no there's no there wasn't any development in there reserved for the central area right and I think this, the the intensification will really help the central area I think that's one of the things and and no matter what they're talking about it does come back to that that we need more apartments we need more housing we need more you know uh, mm -hmm. so, you know we need more parks we need more green spaces. A lot of that is covered under the, under the, the wording in the official plan, how the city's going to grow. And how do you go about explaining the official plan to people? Because I find there's a lot of people who, who kind of underestimate just how important that document is and yeah. don't really understand how influential it's going to but be. But I, I, I think that's some of the conversations we have, right? Mm -hmm. Why is this important? Like, how is your housing issue going to be addressed in the official plan? So then we talk about that, right? That we need more housing. Right? We need more intensification. We need more places for, for people to live. Because, you know, what 1% vacancy rate, because there, there aren't enough apartments. So we need that intensification to increase that vacancy rate to keep rents at a, at a doable level. And intensification right? is something that matters very much to Town Ward. We're going to yeah. dive into housing a little bit later. Sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so housing later. and infrastructure. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but housing and infrastructure, and those are the types of things yeah. you're hearing at the door? and. Not a little bit about infrastructure, okay. right? A little bit, but housing is a big one, and transportation master plan, because parkways, parkways too expensive, et cetera, et cetera. But we still need to understand traffic and mm -hmm. where it's moving and how it's going. So the buses. When I talk about transportation, I'm not just talking about cars. Too, I'm talking about busing, alternate transportation, active transportation. I mean, you have such nice new bike lanes all the yeah, way down yeah, George yeah. now. Yeah. So we need the uh, like that's the common conversations with people. Bike lanes are a hot topic. Busing is a hot topic. It all comes back to that transportation master plan, right? Mm -hmm. Active, active transportation, irrational transportation plan. That you know, that's what people are talking about. So. And how many people do you just in regards to transit? Uh, how many people at the door do you get who say, "I don't own a car. I just bike or transit around." Well, I don't think it's just people who don't own cars who, who transit. I don't think I think that's a misconception that if I don't have a car, people who have cars still still use the buses. I'm one of them actually. I have a car and I still use the bus. Mm -hmm. Because there's sometimes I just don't want to drive, right? I just hop on the bus. I come downtown, <laughs> right? You know? you know, I only live. I live. I'm fortunate. I can walk, right? Twenty minutes from here. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, in the winter, you hop on the bus. I don't want to drive. It's winter. I'm gonna get a bus downtown. Yeah. Right. You know. So I mean, it's not just that, and that's one of the things that affects our transportation, right? Like, mm -hmm. we need to figure out transit. People in Cortha Heights look at the bus system. They want to go to Lansdowne Place. They're like, well, I got this is. 40 minutes to get the Lansdowne place yeah. or get my car, right? So, and they just drive the Lansdowne place. So things like that really need to be figured out. You know, I, I think we need to get off the hub system, mm -hmm. right? I, I think decentralized, we, decentralized transit. transit. Yeah. Well, I think you still need, like, you know, you get 
and I'm not the expert, <laughs> but I still think you need five, maybe six buses coming downtown instead of 14, right? You could do West End, North End, going Shimong Road, yeah. whatever. And as long as buses are looping into those other routes that are coming downtown, I think you're fine. Yeah. But I don't know how that, you got to look at it. Have a Lansdowne <laughs> bus that actually goes up, up and down, down Lansdowne. All day. Yeah. So it's a 20 minute service suddenly because it's, that's all it's doing. Yeah. Right? It uh, lands down. So people are going, oh, it's only 10 minutes to Lansdowne place. I'll hop on. And how would something like that affect the downtown? I don't know. People are, I, I know from my marketing, right? You know, you know, I'm not, you know, downtown has its, its supporters. And the intensification that we're calling for will help the downtown, mm -hmm. right? But when you mark, when I market, for instance, I'm not marketing much past Medical Drive because it's too far for people. They end up, at, of course, uh, they, go, they end up down on Lansdowne anyway. So you market to where you're getting people coming here, right? There's a, there's a line where people will shop downtown. And uh, Flutie did that study, right, uh, a couple of years ago. I don't know if you were cover, covering council back no, then. No. But uh, maybe it was more than four years ago then. But okay. he did a study. They, they, they did a market study on where people are coming from for the, for the central area, right? Okay. So, you know what I mean? So, I mean, you're not – some of those stuff, those people aren't – you need to you need to look at the whole city mm -hmm. as well, right? You know, will it reduce traffic on Lansdowne having a twenty minute bus service on Lansdowne? Sure. Why the heck wouldn't it? Right? You know, and if people want to come downtown, there's a bus going up down George Street, right? They're gonna cross. Mm -hmm. You know, right? So you can get off, hop on George Street and you're in your downtown. Right? Right. It still might only be forty minutes. Mm -hmm. Right? If they're both twenty minute services, it still might be a forty minutes to, to get downtown. So and, you know, I, so. and I do want to talk a little bit more about transportation as well as sure. some other issues, but sure. if you want to take a short break, we'll come back, do another 15 or so Or do you have to do a, a commercial I have to have a something? commercial break, yes. <laughs> Stay tuned. For, <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a message from your sponsor. <laughs> exactly. So we'll be right back. All right. So we're back on the Peter Podcast. And uh, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. And we're going to be talking about a couple of issues that people care about. And I think the first one that we want to talk about is we delved a little bit into transportation, but let's talk the parkway and what sure. your stance on the parkway is. Oh, I just it's no secret where I voted on the parkway. I didn't I didn't support it at the time, and mm -hmm. and now I think our position on the parkway is even worse than it was eight years ago. Sorry, I tapped on this thing. So, oh, no. <laughs> you know, when you look at our debt ceiling, mm -hmm. you know, to keep our tr our tr our AA credit rating, you know, we, we don't have a lot of room there. The parkway is a huge ticket item, and items vary. By the time you, you know, we're, no matter what happens, you're six years away on it. So, cost would be $150 million by then, maybe, right? You don't know, you know. So, it, you know, I think we need to have a really comprehensive transportation master plan. I really think we need to do a review and just figure out our, all of our transportation and not just cars like we are talking about before. We need to figure out our active transportation plan. We need to figure out our, our, our transit. We need to figure out our trail system. We need to figure out, we need to get bike racks on, on buses, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's lots that we need to do. Uh, and, I, and we need to really understand traffic and why it's going where it's going. I mean... You know, I, I, I point to the bus station as we don't understand our, our, our transportation in Peterborough. We still have a hub system, right? You know, it's like no one else. I don't believe there's many other cities in Ontario that have a hub system. You could look it up. I'm not sure. But every, every place I go is off the hub system, right? Yeah. So I think there's a better way to move buses around, right? Okay. So. And, uh, you know, I've, I've heard a couple of alternatives to, uh, to the parkway. One of them is five laning Shimong, uh, do something which, with which is which is on the books. Yes, uh, do something with Fairburn because that that there's a large amount of cut traffic that goes through there. Fairburn needs to be four lane, and every traffic study we've ever had shows Fairburn being four lane. Yeah, you know Park Hill needs to be four lane all mm -hmm. the way across the whole city. Braley needs to be four lane, and I think I think we should do that anyway. All right, I think mm -hmm. we need to do that no matter what we do. Uh, I you know I, and you know I always raised up, why aren't we four-laning Park Hill? We're, we're building, if you, if you driven out Park Hill? Uh, yeah, I'm on there often. You put the, how wide is the bed? It's wide enough for four lanes. Yeah. And they paved two, and I don't understand, I do understand, but I, I, I was very supportive of putting four lanes in there while you put the four-lane bed in. Like right now, you just have this boulevard, massive 
swath of boulevard that you could have put four lanes on there. So how do we go about planning for the future then? Should we be building roads with four lanes in anticipation that these are going to be like major well, corridors? Well, some major point? corridors. And I think the parkway in Braille are major corridors. Mm -hmm. like the they existing are, parkway. That is in, uh, yeah. the existing major yeah. collector or whatever you want to call them, the major arterials, right? They should have been four lanes. You know, Tremong Road should have been five lane already. Like, we've knocked down those houses already. What, where, you know, we need to get that work done. Yeah. Right? And that'll help a lot. Right? If you get Tremong Road really fixed up, I think that'll have a big impact. Especially on traffic in the north end. Yeah, and your award mate, uh, Diane Tyrion, who's yeah. also running for mayor, yeah. has, uh, you know, not just her, there are a couple people who've suggested the ring road, but uh, yeah. what are your thoughts on the ring road idea? I, I, I think it'd be fine, but I just don't understand it yet. Mm. I'm not going to lie to you. I got I to gotta see the study on it and understand where it would go. But to me, I've always been a big proponent. You know where County Road 19 is at the Subaru dealership? You go out of Peter Road, you hit Shemong Road, you hit the Subaru dealership. That's okay, County Road yep. 19. Yep. You can fire that right through the, the, the hydro lines to Braley. Fire it. Mm. And we own the land behind... Uh, behind that last house, I won't mention the person's name, <laughs> on, on Hilliard, behind there that goes down to Cumberland. Oh, okay. So you could fire a road from Cumberland right through to Braley through there. Mm -hmm. Right? You need some county cooperation because some of it's in the county. Yeah. Obviously. But that that would take the north, that would alleviate a lot of the north end traffic because they could shoot right over to Braley on a straight line. Mm -hmm. right? And do you think that would help resolve some of the internal traffic in Peterborough, especially those yeah. people that are driving down Fairbarn and... Yeah, because it because it cuts across the north end. Okay. Right. So all that north end traffic, and we'd let we'd have to see the get mm -hmm. an, an actual engineer to to model it, right? So, but we'd have to figure out. But in my mind, I think I would like to see that road in as well as Park Hill four lanes and Braley four lanes and yeah, you know Fairburn needs to be four laned. You know, we'd we'd have to lose the uh, driveway down into. Jackson Park, but we still have the other one because mm -hmm. you need to put a turn a proper turning lane in there. Yeah. Right? So where cars can stack because you need cars to, to be able to stack turn left or right. The problem on that bridge right now is cars are stacked and they're trying to turn left or right and they're stacking onto the bridge. So if you had a proper turning lane set up, it would give those cars a place to stack. So with the bridge there, that's over the existing bridge over Jackson Park. There would that have to be widened or? I, I don't know. I'd have yeah. to go up there and count it. I don't. Okay. I had to get up my tape measure. <laughs> <laughs> see, see how much room we have on each side of the bridge. So, I'm not. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So it's, it'd be unfair of me to say that. But okay. Yeah, I don't know. But I do think, no matter what you think of the parkway, we need a turning lane at, at uh, Park Hill and Monaghan, and one yeah. in Fairburn and Monaghan. And I mean, you know, Monaghan traffic, the twenty some thousand cars a day, or it's coming up Monaghan. It's not going to go left to the parkway and then across the bridge. It's still turning right. It's still going around the park and out that way, regardless of what you think about the parkway. That intersection is still going to be a congested intersection because that because no one's going to turn left to go right. Mm -hmm. This doesn't happen, right? You yeah. know, right? So they're still turning right on Park Hill, regardless of the parkway bridge going over or not. And right, right, I've asked a couple of people, you know, do we have a, a, a transportation problem in Peterborough? And I've heard a couple of yeses and a couple of no's. <sighs> what are your thoughts? Do we have a transportation problem in uh, Peterborough? I've been saying you can't hide your head in the parkway sand anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right? I think we need to get on with it. And sure, and, and at peak times, there's traffic issues, right? I, I think there's traffic issues. But we need, to, we need a smart growth. We need a smart traffic plan. We need, to, we need to really understand traffic. And we haven't done that yet. So... Is it a problem? Sure, it's sometimes it is that, that, that there is a problem, but is it Toronto traffic? No. Right? Is it even Oshawa traffic? No. Mm -hmm. Right? Is it, is it heavy for Peterborough? Probably. You yeah. know what I mean? Is it yeah. like, what's your, what's your bell point? Is it, is it Bridge North traffic? Well, compared to Bridge North, George Street is congested. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know what I mean? Like, what's your, what's your metrics? Yeah, and I think so. There, I mean, there, it's kind of a it's kind of a funny question, right? There's also the fear, mm -hmm. and this is something that I believe that okay, let's say we don't have a traffic problem yet, or let's say that our traffic problems are relatively light in comparison to to other communities uh, like the ones that you mentioned. Um, we are expecting that there's going to be a wave of growth coming in with this 407 extension, um, mm -hmm. and that's going to add to the number of cars that are on our roads, or you know, bikes in our bike lanes, or people sure. in our buses. And well, that's why we need to understand for transportation. Have a rational transportation plan. For, our, for 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 the growth, right? That's Do you think we're going to be ready for that growth? Well, um, absolutely. Why not? <laughs> I have no question that we'll be ready for the growth. All right. Yeah, I think people in Peterborough are pretty smart. Okay. And I think we'll figure it out. 
Yeah. All right. Yeah. And uh, let's transition on to, you know, PDI. Yeah. And you said, you know, you were against the PDI sale. Still am. Still am? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But what are your thoughts on maybe explain to people why you voted the way you did? Well, I, I opposed from the very first that I felt, and I don't, I don't, first of all, I don't believe that uh, we need to modernize our PDI. I'm not, no one's convinced me of that. Our sales have gone up. 1.1 million, was it almost 1.8 this year? So it's gone up instead of down like we were told in the doom and gloom days, right? Our, our infrastructure, John Stevenson, is fine, right? So first of all, I, I'm unconvinced that it needs modernization, right? So I still need, I still need to get there. I, I, I haven't got there, just like most people in Peterborough. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you're also privatizing a public utility. You don't privatize something that's for the good of the public, right? You don't do, it's like privatizing George Street. So you wouldn't do that, right? You, you can't know? put a toll road on George no, Street. No, <laughs> it won't work. <laughs> it'll work, right? So, uh, you know, so there, there's all of those arguments too. Mm -hmm. And then there's the big argument that the motion was to sell to Hydro One. Right, explore sale to Hydro One. There was no other offer. There was no no one else was allowed to offer. You know, uh, a few of us have gotten phone call. Like I like I got a phone call from a, the other utility saying, "Why can't we bid?" Uh, Viridian was at the meeting saying, "Hear us out." Even staff, it was like, "Well, maybe we should hear what they have to offer." But we were not allowed to to even explore other bids. Would you sell your business to only one bidder? Would you tell your real estate agent, "I want you to sell to John Smith"? I guess it depends on the deal. I mean, was was the PDI deal good enough that you? We, well, we'll never know. Yeah. All right, we'll never know if if Viridian or any of these other people had a better had a better offer on the table. You know, we were told by Viridian, of course, but we never saw the deal that we had been the fourth largest hydro pro provider in Ontario had we merged with them. Hmm. Well, let's see what that deal looks like. We we never got the chance to even explore it. So so I mean, you wouldn't sell your house that way. Why would you sell your hundred and five million dollar asset that way? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah. just, like. Maybe it's my business sense just getting better in me that, you know, first of all, do we need to sell? Secondly, if we are, why aren't we getting the best deal? Right? <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. And, and we kept the debt. Have you ever sold a company and you kept the debt? Have you ever heard of that? I can't say that I have. <laughs> so, well, we did it. City of Eatroll did it. Hmm. Had her $5 million and we pay off the debt. Okay. There's, like, I mean, there's lots of reasons, right? Yeah. But I think it's a really complicated issue and. And a lot of the boxes weren't checked mm -hmm. for, for, to get my vote. They just weren't checked. Yeah, and I talked to, uh, on the podcast, I previously talked to uh, Keith Riel, and he, yeah. he's planning to challenge the Ontario Energy Board who has to approve the sale. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there's any recourse of, of stopping the, the sale before it happens? Is there anything that you would be doing, or well, is it just kind of I don't know happening? the time. I do not know the timing of the OEB. Okay. So I do not know that. I know that no sale is final until the OEB hears it. Mm -hmm. Right, so I guess we have to wait to see what, what when that is. If there's and, a hearing and uh, they're asking for for people like you know constituents or city councilors to speak at that hearing, sure, I, w I would oppose it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because I still don't think it's the right deal. Yeah. I still I still remain unconvinced that it's the, it's the right deal for the city of Peterborough. And you don't think mm -hmm. that the money from the deal is 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 needed or? Well, we always need money. <laughs> I got a question was that. Yeah. yeah. We always need money. But again, when you weigh everything against it, right, is the deal the best deal you're going to get? And is the asset making more money every year, which it did this year, mm -hmm. right? You know, that's what, you know, if you look at the thing, it, it, it didn't lose money. It was supposed to be down to seventy five or $750,000 or something like that. And it didn't happen, right? So, okay. so, I mean, the PUS made more money this year. Than, than it ever has. It was, a, it was a record year for the whole company. Okay. So, I mean, I don't know. I would oppose it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we're just going to move on to our last topic before we close up for Absolutely. today. Absolutely. And let's talk about housing. And you talked a little bit about intensification, and I think that that is kind of the core that's, focus. Right yeah, now that's where I was downtown. going with that. Yeah. yeah. So, no, uh, we needed intensification. We need housing. Mm -hmm. Right? We need to control. We need in. Yeah, what's the wording on that? We have a 1% vacancy rate, and that's too low. Yeah. Right? That 1% vacancy rate needs to increase in order, and because we need affordable uh, housing for people as well. Yeah, and, and everyone that I've talked to about housing, is, you know, they, they've said that they're in favor of intensification. And I think the concern from some people is that, especially these redevelopment projects that are happening, 
that low income places are being redeveloped and spiffied up and that that's pushing people with low income out of the downtown. Do you see that? Do you think that's a concern of yours? Well, you know, when I, at, at our charrette, and I've had this conversation with, uh, with uh, Jeff as well, our planning director, Jeff Humble. <laughs> uh, I've had this conversation with Jeff too, that as we redevelop buildings, we need to save space, especially for artists in the downtown, as well as uh, people in need for, of housing. So we can't squeeze them all out as we redevelop. So I have had those conversations with Jeff. So especially, both of those are valid, right? You know, mm -hmm. like we need to keep uh, housing af uh, affordable, but by making more of it, we'll do that. We need to uh, save space for what makes our central area vibrant, which is our, our uh, which is our, our arts and our culture, right? We can't redevelop the downtown and squeeze out all the musicians and all and all the artists. Yeah, right. You can't do that. Right, and because that's what makes your downtown vibrant. So you need to balance that growth. And in the the very early days of your podcast, I had yeah. on uh, Ann Yeager, yeah. uh, downtown arts advocate, yeah, yeah. and uh, she had spoken to me about the concern that artists go into spaces, they liven them up, they generate uh, they yeah. generate a lot of activity in these areas, yeah. and then developers scoop up the properties because they're make. Yeah develop them, make them un unaffordable, and then the artists then have to leave. Move out and start again. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 how do you, is that something that you see happening? And if so, I how do you seen stop it, it? I haven't seen it happening yet, but. Is that, it a concern of yours? It is a concern. And, and I have brought it up with more than one occasion to our director of planning as it goes through this official planning document. Mm -hmm. That we need to, we do need to reserve that space for artists in our community. Like we can't, we can't squeeze them out. Right. Because it, it is what happens. They're, they're, they're what makes the central area vibrant, yeah, right. You know yeah. their talent and their sweat and their their fantastic knowledge. They're they're very talented individuals. You can go out on any night and see some very talented musicians in, in this town, mm -hmm. and uh, and and there's no money in the arts, right? So most of the time, these artists are selling their paintings, doing their visual arts, making movies, and it's not a it's not a high paying occupation. So but it is what keeps our downtown vibrant. So they can only afford so much studio space. They can't pay double yeah. that for studio space or pro rehearsal space or video space because all their money's in their equipment and in their, and in their you know, if they're a videographer, it's, it is in their equipment, right? Or yeah. Like, so what so. about the people who are low income, who, you know, aren't artists who, you know, they well, ask to sure. be downtown because it's where all the services sure, that they Sure, absolutely. Are. And we can't squeeze them out either. And I've been a big proponent of, of that's why I talked about that earlier on. And we need to we, we need to reserve space for, for, for both of those groups, mm -hmm. right? We we can't squeeze them out because we we we're going to end up housing them anyway. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Like the city's going to end up housing no matter what you do. We're going to if we squeeze them out, then we then we have to house them. And, right? a, there, right? and there is a huge waiting list for social housing from the city too. So, so you know, we only we only worsen our our own problems if we if we aren't mindful of that. So how do you have those conversations? Do you have those conversations with private developers to encourage that there be some low income housing? Well, you know, we downtown? brought it up. We brought it up several times too, right? And the last government, we we'd had several conversations about because it's all covered under the Planning Act. Period. Right. So we've had several conversations doing what you're talking about, mm -hmm. about reserving spots in their development for, for, uh, for affordable housing, right? Because that needs to be reserved in their, in their development. You know, but we haven't heard anything from this new provincial government as if the Planning Act, the Planning Act would need to change to allow us to require that, right? As, as, a, as, a, as a condition of development, yeah. right? But having said that, when you look at Knox United Church, I think it's a shining example of what the city can do on its own. We waive building permit charges, we waive development charges, you know, we defer taxes to future years. And that's an affordable housing project that works. And if you drive by, it's a lovely building. Mm -hmm. They've done a very good job on that. They've, they've kept the, uh, the heritage features intact. They've, they've enhanced them. So I think there is a role that municipalities can play in creating affordable housing. And we take every opportunity to kind of do so. And we need to, but we need to, you know, as as older housing stock comes over and developers are coming up and they're looking for breaks, that's that's the tool that we can use. Well, we control the development charges, we control the, 
the uh, the building permit. Sorry, we can we, we can refund those to you, right? So there are ways that we can work with developers to, to kind of make that happen. All right, Dean, we're just about to run out of time. Are there any messages or anything else that you want to add while you're uh, here? I hope you support uh, Dean Pappas on October 22nd. I've been, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve the good people of Peterborough for the last 12 years. And I hope that continues. Thank you. Awesome, Dean. Thank you so much for being on the show. I really Thank you. appreciate it. Cheers, buddy. And to everybody else, we'll see you again soon.